Hello, I'm George Malin, the Managing Editor of Vanilla Plus, and welcome to today's webinar, the topic of which is 5G positioning and pricing strategies, driving early success. Now is an ideal time to explore this topic because 5G is just starting to become a commercial reality um, in several markets across the world. And how 5G is positioned, packaged, and priced will be critical in building a competitive 5G proposition that drives uptake and profitability. I think it's clear by now that 5G is not just the next G in a bloodline of 3GPP generations. It's a step change and a chance to reassess what a cellular network can be and how it should be charged for. I'm therefore delighted to welcome today's speakers, Paul Gainham, the Director of Strategic Marketing at Matrix Software, and Susan Welsh de Grimaldo, the Director of Service Provider Strategies at Strategy Analytics. Paul and Susan will share the results gathered from end-user study groups and operator interviews on 5G positioning and pricing, and they'll seek to answer the question of whether mobile operators are getting it right when it comes to 5G. Um, Paul, I'm going to hand over to you now um, to uh, set the scene and uh, introduce your presentation. So, uh, Paul, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, George. And uh, can I add my welcome to all of those attending and say a big thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, my name, as George mentioned, is uh, Paul Gain. I'm the Director of Strategic Marketing at uh, Matrix Software. Uh, Matrix Software delivers a digital commerce platform uh, used at the heart of many 3 and 4G networks today for online charging, rating, and policy, as well as acting now as a converged charging system for 5G networks. Um, I wanted to share some brief thoughts on what we're seeing as 5G enters the market uh, before handing over to Susan from Strategy Analytics, we'll dive into the meat of the research that we undertook. Um, before doing that, I, I'm going to hand back to George just to introduce an introductory poll question, which may be of interest to the audience. Um, George, back over to you. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, the poll is, is going to turn up on your screen in the next second or so, but while we're waiting for that to happen, um, I'd remind everyone in the audience that you've got the opportunity to ask our speakers questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So simply put those into your uh, panel on screen and uh, I'll put those to, to the speakers at the end. Anyway, turning to the first poll, uh, the question is, when thinking about the 5G plans you have seen mobile operators launch so far, what is your opinion of them? And the possible responses are groundbreaking and innovative across the board with strong customer appeal. Second choice is a mixed bag. There's some real innovation, but some of it is business as usual. The third point, it's just another G, and there's no real difference to 4G. Uh, the fourth point, safe but unexciting uh, without a wow factor. And finally, lacking innovation across the board with little customer appeal. And I think things have settled down, so oh, it's still a little bit of movement, but uh, it looks very clearly that um, the two categories, the, the second one, <laughs> a mixed bag with some real innovation mm -hmm. and some business as usual is being picked by most people. Um, but the next most popular one is safe but unexciting with, with no wow factor. Mm -hmm. Paul, is that roughly as, as you'd expect, or, or did you expect um, a little bit more uh, positive excitement towards the kind of top end of the, the options? Mm. No, I think it's in line, George. I think, you know, on the extremes, as you probably see, the two questions, the first and the last one, are more of the, uh, dare I say, extreme view. So I did kind of expect a bunching uh, in the middle there, and it, it is no surprise. I think so far, um, dare I say, the jury is still out on whether operators are getting their uh, the 5G positioning is right, but it's not a, uh, you know, kind of a lost cause anywhere near yet. So uh, still lots of grounds to, uh, to to innovate and to improve. Um, so, no, I think it's uh, that's a fair representation of what I would have expected. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. I'll hand back to you uh, for your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so just moving on then, um, kind of if not us, if not now, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? Uh, that's a quote for me that magnifies the need to act early and act ahead of the competition, given the potential value and appeal of 5G as a service platform. Getting the pricing and positioning of 5G plans and offers right at the get-go 
in the existing product catalog when set against existing 4G plans and offering the right level of service-based innovation is possibly the hardest challenge confronting telco commercial teams. The historic telco challenge at every inflection point technology launch has been an over-rotation towards network-centric thinking and positioning. Looking at the lower line of the slide, um, too often, once the initial euphoria and early adopter period is over, during which normally a short price premium exists, the commodity nature of simple connectivity products inexorably leads to a competitive price-based landscape based on a lack of differentiation and effectively a race to the bottom ensues. Looking at the top line, a digital first service based offering that draws on the underlying monetization levers and utilizing a powered by 5G approach uh, based on the four key principles of delivering transparency, real time on demand, user self control and personalization uh, delivers a much richer service engagement model that with frequent additional sachet service uh, self help offerings each delivered, dare I say, for the cost of a cup of coffee, um, will help sustain and grow the initial price, premium, and margin. Those sachet service additions could be things such as online gaming passes, smart family offerings, geolocation services, you know, virtual reality or video boost services, and could be in-house developed uh, or delivered via and with conjunction uh, with third parties via new business models such as B2B2C. Having them delivered from a core digital grade commerce platform means that they can be updated and refreshed in hours or days, facilitating a truly fast to market, fast to fail philosophy and agility. The much sought after 5G digital dividend can only be delivered and crucially sustained uh, with that kind of digital service innovation uh, at its heart. Early 5G launches have shown a number of different approaches to the underlying base 5G pricing plan and offerings. Approaches that we have seen have included the following. First, offering greater data volume at the same price point, which signals an intent to drive a greater early uptake of 5G maybe, but it could be argued an approach that also devalues it. Secondly, offering greater data volume on 5G with a price premium of between maybe 10 to 15% over 4G, which recognizes the additional value, but offers little in terms of innovation or differentiation. Third, a move from volume tier-based pricing to speed-based uh, pricing with unlimited data volume. An interesting approach as it changes the dynamic away from volume and may attract new customers as a result of that early, but that may quickly revert to a race to the bottom, as fundamentally it does again very little to differentiate the offering and demonstrate real sustainable value. Finally, uh, remapping of 4G plans to deliver higher volume with little to no price movement and as part of that new plan, offer 5G as a quote unquote free upgrade with device and network availability. Similar to earlier plans, this sets a perception of little added value in 5G and will drive a race to the bottom in terms of pricing and differentiation. So from a, dare I say, a school report card perspective, it could be argued that approaches to date warrant probably a grade C, could do better, room for improvement. Um, too much maybe network centric thinking remains, the danger of which is a perception that 5G adds little value and will become simply another G, fought for purely on price. A really key question for the telco industry to consider, is it creating a sufficient wow factor that will compel users to move from 4G to 5G and create that crucial sustainable business model that will begin to pay back the huge investments involved. With that, George, let me hand back to you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think we're now in a situation where we're going to welcome uh, Susan uh, Welsh de Grimaldo, the Director of Service Provider Strategies at uh, Strategy Analytics, to give her presentation. So, uh, Susan, um, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I'll hand the floor over to you. 
Great. Thank you very much, George and Paul, for that introduction to the, the great topics we're discussing today. And I want to thank Vanilla Plus for hosting today's webinar and Matrix Software particularly for sponsoring our research and analysis on this really timely topic. 5G obviously has been in development for quite some time, but as it's really launching and hitting into markets um, this year and, and as we move towards next year, we're seeing a lot of demand and interest around topics of how do you actually take it out to market to the people who will be buying it and using the services. So my name is Susan Walshtake Grimaldo. I work at Strategy Analytics. We're a global company that does industry uh, analysis and consulting, and we also have a great team that does user experience work um, and con customer insights. So I'll be drawing on some of their research as part of this. So to start off, when we thought about this, how do you think about driving 5G success in the near to midterm? Of course, you know, 10 years out, things will look different, but what's it going to be over the next year or two? How will we really get early success with 5G? So in the near to midterm, the key to faster payback on all the investments being made for 5G is to create a pool to get the next wave of users to upgrade to 5G beyond just the initial wave of early adopters. So what we've seen as we've examined the market globally, uh, the situation is that a lot of CSPs have not really figured out the best ways to drive 5G adoption to mass market and monetize services. Another key factor to keep in mind is that 5G positioning and pricing will evolve, and we've already seen in some markets that the initial out-the-gate pricing has changed. In terms of needs, CSPs need to expand their thinking on how and what they offer customers with 5G across all their user segments. And CSPs need to expand their role in the 5G ecosystem to really create that monetization opportunity and recoup some of their investment costs. Now, how is this going to be done? Of course, we'll be digging into some of the aspects of this today. It's a big, broad topic, and it's evolving. Um, but today, we'll be looking a little bit at how the CSPs really need to focus on what we've seen starting in 4G, and that is to become much more customer-centric and find ways to use 5G to solve customer pain points and wow customers with new experiences and uses to attract them to 5G. And the CSPs also need to expand their digital engagement to drive additional discovery and needs-based upsells among 5G users. So diving into this, um, I'd encourage you actually to go, and we'll provide a link at the end. We did a full report on this topic, so you can download that and access a bit more detail on some of these different topics. We looked at some of the key challenges that are going to be faced um, as you think about pricing strategies and positioning strategies for 5G. One of the challenges is how do you think about not creating too much data commoditization? Um, obviously, 5G over time will introduce better efficiency in terms of delivering on cost per bit given to the end user. Um, and there's a competitive challenge that we may see markets where it's a race to the bottom in terms of pricing for how much data is delivered. Over time, however, 5G is going to create an opportunities to do new types of things and new ways to monetize. So how do you think about what else can you monetize and how do you avoid just creating a commoditized uh, race to the bottom pricing competition? Another big challenge, and especially in the early days, is the high cost of devices for 5G. Uh, people need to have a 5G device to access the 5G network. Uh, so how do you think about that in your markets across the different segments? And another challenge, how do you drive demand for 5G? 4G in many markets has been quite successful and it's delivering very good data speeds and has been improving. So how do you get people to consider why would they want to move to 5G and buy a new device to access the new networks? And another big challenge that goes along in general, uh, not just in 5G but in 4G, is how do you think about simplifying plans and making it easier for end users to decide what it is that they need? Uh, this is something that, you know, as you think about the different levers and the ways to customize and create opportunities that deliver to different segments what they need with 5G, if it gets too complicated, it will be confusing to consumers, especially as well as enterprises. So that's another challenge to think through. Does 5G complicate that? And how do you introduce plans without making it too complex? 
So one of the great things that we did here in this in this space and early days is understanding what do consumers think about 5G and how are you going to get them to adopt this? So I have the benefit of working with a wonderful team of user experience experts, um, and they had done some qualitative analysis. Um, it's very important to do quantitative analysis to create segmentation and analysis of what will really drive value propositions for different groups of consumers. But we wanted to get a sense qualitatively in discussing in more depth with people People, what are some of the awareness and attitudes towards 5G? And then once benefits of 5G are explained, how does that really resonate with them in terms of low latency, coverage, capacity, uh, security, some of the different things that you might be seeing with 5G, and explain that to them a bit more. And then what we did was introduce a range of potential use cases with 5G, sort of early stage ones in particular, to gauge a bit what the interest level is and what some of their concerns are and whether they think they would be likely to want to use these services. Um, so we did two different focus groups. One was in the UK and one was in the US. And the report dives a bit more into details and some of the different analysis here. But one of the key points we found was that most consumers really have an interest in 5G, but there are quite a few that still need to really be convinced of the benefits. So they were very positive about the potential for 5G to deliver new and exciting value propositions. And you can see in this chart here, that there was a, an early in the green, there was an early adopter segment that said, yes, I'm ready and motivated to sign up to 5G mobile contract as soon as it's available in my area. And I think the key area that we focused on here is that there was a very large bulk of people who said, I'm interested in 5G, but I'm going to wait and see. I want to make sure it really lives up to my expectations. And in our perspective, that these consumers that have some interest in 5G, but this initial wait and see attitude, this will really be in the consumer space, the key segment to determine how successful 5G is in the very early days, the first year or so, and how do you drive to more of a mass market adoption. Certainly in the future, we'll see a point where 5G really is just the norm and everyone has it. But how do we more quickly drive adoption in early stages to help monetize a bit more quickly with 5G. This group of users we found really need to be wowed by 5G services. They need to find a sufficient value delta over 4G services in order to upgrade, and it really needs to address some of their pain points that they have. So based on the use cases that we did introduce, um, some of the top ones we found were really those that solve pain points and, and look at what the needs of the customers are. So obviously here, perhaps to some, and this is certainly an area that's of interest in 5G, is home broadband replacement, an opportunity to have better broadband in your home through fixed wireless access. One of the other areas that really uh, attracted interest was things that look at how do you get a better connection, particularly in congested areas or in fast-moving vehicles. So ultra HD entertainment in transit, for example. Media streaming at events. Uh, we looked also at an interest in AR and VR field training. So it's not just for these consumers as their own role, but as their job as employees. And then we looked at things such as high accuracy location-based applications, holographic telephony, cloud editing and management of documents, so a whole range of services that will reside in the cloud that people will access through their phones. Wearables is certainly an area that there was an interest, and ultra HD game streaming. I think the exciting thing with 5G is that it really is a platform for innovation, and over time we'll see lots more innovation around use cases. Um, but we tried to assess based on some of the early ones that we're seeing discussed in market what the reactions of the consumers were to these. And based on these focus groups, we found that some of the key opportunities here is that consumers do express strong interest in 5G overall once they understand the benefits and some of the use cases. Some of the opportunities fall into three domains. One is next generation media experiences, particularly immersive media and rich media. Connected objects, so going beyond just the smartphone, and also fixed home broadband replacement. And as I mentioned, particularly the ability to have good quality service in congested areas is also a key area. Now some of the risks based on looking at this is that Overall, we found consumer satisfaction in these two markets in particular was quite high around 4G mobile data experience. People found that they really wanted to have something that was compelling and differentiated to help them think about why they would want to adopt 5G. 
and there were certainly some consumer concerns around 5G, such as when will it really be available? How much will it cost? How will it impact my battery life? So in terms of recommendations, we would say that specific effort really needs to be made to address consumer skepticism around their need for 5G. They need to be convinced that it's not just some marketing ploy to get the carriers to raise prices. Operators have a real role, as well as other players in the ecosystem, to educate consumers about the benefits of 5G and in terms of how they roll out and market the plans that they're offering, such as the ability to solve existing pain points and improve connectivity, potentially in high network demand situations. Now, another aspect that we looked at in terms of qualitatively trying to understand where we are in the market and where the opportunities and risks and challenges are is to dig into the perspectives of leading operators around the world in terms of their per approaches to 5G, the positioning and the pricing strategies. Um, so here again, we did a qualitative range of in-depth interviews with a various number of CSPs from different regions. Uh, we talked to different people because a CSP, of course, as everyone knows, is many people and many teams working together to bring this stuff to market. We focused in particular on people in the service planning and pricing areas, both for consumers as well as IoT and enterprise B2B products. But we also talked to network teams and C-level executives to get their perspectives. Now, a couple of the interesting challenges we found being voiced from a Korean operator, they mentioned it's hard to differentiate in the long term based just on network coverage and quality or on price levels. So for them, the main focus in 5G commercialization has been creating a set of compelling 5G services available for free for all 5G subscribers. And the 4G speeds in Korea are particularly already high, which makes it hard to upgrade subscribers to 5G without services. And for those of you who may not be aware, all three of the Korean operators have launched 5G services, and I think we've seen now at least 3 million subscribers. So they're getting good uptake, and it's a very good market to look at to understand some of the things that are being done to drive 5G uptake. We also heard from a European operator that everyone likes to talk about use cases and new things that 5G can bring. But the fact is that 4G is pretty good where it's not too congested, and 4G is improving. So you really need to think about 5G within the landscape of an improving 4G network. It's very important when you're thinking about 5G positioning and pricing that it needs to be in context for the particular market where it's being launched. And there are a lot of big picture considerations to take into um, your, your factoring into your strategy development here. So on the right-hand side here, three of the things that we at Strategy Analytics have looked at are that 5G is arriving into a relatively mature market with tight competitive environments. Out the gate, 5G pricing will evolve. So what we see initially will change over time. And it's important to think about and to do research and analysis on what are the different value propositions value propositions for different customer segments. And 5G needs to be positioned by explaining how it improves lives and businesses, not just as it's the next G or a better network. So when we talked about this with the operators that we interviewed, um, I wanted to uh, quote here from Orange VP of Consumer Marketing Europe, James Stoker, who highlighted several of the big picture items that they take into consideration in each of their markets as they develop a distinct approach in each market for how they're going about thinking on 5G launch. First one was convergence. You know, what's the, what's the situation between fixed and mobile services and bundling in that market? What is their specific market position? Are they a market leader or are they a challenger in that market? What's the competitive landscape and pricing situation? And how is that expected to evolve? What's the customer readiness? How likely is it that certain percentages of customers will be able to buy the devices at the price points that they are at when 5G launches in that market? And what's the network and spectrum position and holdings that they have? What's available to be used for launch of 5G? And considering as well here, the converged networks, both the fixed side and fiber as well. So for each operator, it's going to be distinct exactly what the different things you need to consider, but it does need to be taken in context. There is no one size fits all. Now, when you think about positioning 5G 
along 4G services. And as I mentioned, 5G is evolving and rolling out over time. 4G is extremely important. It's still a strong working horse in this environment. So when you're thinking about how you position 5G alongside your 4G current service portfolio, are you focusing on 5G services as just enhancing what users do today with 4G or on bringing new services and experiences to market? This is one of the questions we asked across the board to the operators we interviewed. And we found sort of four categories of interesting things here. One was a perspective by some of the operators that for consumers, 4G or 5G is really just an evolution of what you can do with 4G, but will bring new capabilities for enterprise. We certainly found the perspective that 5G in some cases is a whole new game. There was a focus on 5G as improving speed and capacity, as well as supporting rich experiences. So in the, in the report itself, we certainly have more quotes and information on the different questions we've asked, but some of the ones to highlight here was from the APAC region. There was a Tier 1 operator we spoke with that noted that 4G strategy will generally be kept for consumers, and 5G will be an enhancement of that. But in the enterprise market, they're really looking forward to a situation where 5G will provide new capabilities that they don't have today with 4G. In terms of 5G being a whole new game, I thought it was put very well by Enrique Blanco, who's the, the global CTIO at Telefonica, who said that in 4G, we are serving customers. In 5G, we will be serving societies. And Alexis Hostos of Telefonica's B2B, who's the head of their product strategy in the B2B area, really talked a lot about how 5G is not just about connectivity, the way 3G and 4G has been, but really in the enterprise space, uh, the 5G ecosystem as it emerges will really offer an opportunity for disruption from focusing on the connectivity and look at other areas of value to be added. Sunrise in Switzerland, which has launched 5G, uh, did talk about at 5G World that they see that 5G is worth the premium they're charging based on the performance that it's delivering. And in terms of exporting rich experiences, I spoke with the CEO of one of the opcos of a European operator who said that they're really focusing not so much on the number of sites with 5G, but on what you can really do with it and what the experience is. And they see an interesting opportunity for using content assets for VR and gaming and consumer services that really will benefit with 5G. So it's kind of a mix across the board about how exactly 5G will deliver on the consumer space, but certainly a focus on the ability of 5G over time to be transformative, particularly in enterprise and in society in general. Now, one of the main things to focus on here is what are those pricing mechanisms in 5G? You know, it, how do you think about what to build into as levers and uh, triggers inside the 5G pricing plans? So we asked, what do you think operators should be focusing on to encourage uptake of 5G? And how should you look at innovating in pricing models as you try to drive uptake from 3G and 4G into 5G? And I think as Paul had mentioned, some of the early stage pricing plans out there, there really is a sense that 5G should have a premium, but there's no one size fits all approach. There seems to be based on the plans currently launched and on the attitudes of the operators, that putting 5G in premium tiers is a good approach, but a straight up extra fee for 5G is not a viable option, at least not for very long, given competitive environments. Um, and when we spoke here with Orange, uh, James Stoker noted that no one size fits all when it comes to 5G pricing strategies, and each market is inherently different. And we need to be pragmatic, pragmatic about approach, uh, but look at flexibility to take bolder steps down the line. So again, here we see pricing opportunities to evolve over time. Speed and latency, these are both two categories that we found that operators are certainly considering how do they introduce speed tiering. We certainly have seen markets where there was speed tiering with 4G um, and, and more moves to think about that in the 5G arena. And latency is something that we have not yet seen CSPs really move to incorporate, but we do have um, indications that they're studying this and thinking about how do you then take these levers um, and create something new in the 5G world. And again, here with Orange, they pointed out um, that one of the key things to keep in mind is it needs to be based on genuine customer need-driven use cases and also think about how does that impact the cost structure to deliver these new services. So continuing on this theme of what the pricing mechanics are, 
we found that operators are seeing some opportunity to consider service-based apps and 5G plans that look at bundled pricing for multiple connected devices as options. We're also seeing um, some attitudes that there's a good fit with offering custom size plans in 5G to give customers control and flexibility to switch plans or plan elements as desired. So in terms of service-based apps, one of the operators we spoke to in Asia Pacific said that they were considering opportunities around VR-centric or HD video-centric plans that offer a certain number of hours um, free for using for content on these very rich immersive services uh, and then a regular data volume for other uses. And in the business case, they're looking at for enterprise customers that there might be things around international roaming or cloud services or other value-added services that have special pricing bundles and app-based focus. In terms of custom plans, of again here one of the customers we spoke to, or one of the operators we spoke to in Europe was thinking that they already have some custom plans and ability for customers to do, make choices about what they want and customize for their own needs, and they see an opportunity for that to fit well with 5G because people want to pay for what they want. Um, and Vodafone UK, as they launched, really talked about that the consumer control and flexibility they see as a key point in their 5G plans they have launched. So certainly delivering to the customers what they want and giving them options to have flexibility around that. And this fits nicely with the next thing that we talked about, which was digital engagement and how does that feed into how you think about your 5G positioning and pricing and getting out to customers. So the question we asked was, given the market timing, should operators now be pursuing real-time pricing model controlled by the user via self-care apps and reduce reliance on retail stores and call centers? And we found across the board that the service providers see a greater role for real-time self-care apps in the 5G era. And in fact, they see digital engagement as essential in 5G. As one operator noted in AsiaPAC, self-care apps are a trend that's not directly rated with 5G, but it's timed nicely with how 5G is coming in the market. And another tier one operator in AsiaPAC, and we found this across the board, that operators were saying they still value offline channels to improve customer engagement and loyalty, and will continue to invest in the improving of their offline engagement, even as they invest and focus on better opportunities in digital and online channels. Um, so we certainly saw that self-care apps will be more popular in the 5G area, era, and Vodafone, head of network, said that they certainly envision a global service platform where anyone can come and self-serve, to have a programmable, open, and self-service network that's flexible and efficient enough to cope with unanticipated market demand. In Orange, we heard them say that for operators, this ability is going to be essential capability to be digital first and human support as and when needed. And it's only natural that they would absolutely want to take advantage of that in 5G. So one of the things we talked about beyond just the consumer market is the enterprise space. And we certainly see that 5G is exciting and critical both for consumers and enterprise. Many service providers today have the bulk of their revenues in the consumer space. And there certainly are attitudes that consumers are not an area that you should overlook 5G. Don't say it's just about enterprise revenue, but certainly look about how 5G can increase and up your game in the enterprise services area. So much excitement around 5G being a growth area in the enterprise services space. Now, enterprise pricing models are evolving, and service providers are seeing enterprise services as a significant area for disruption and enhancement, with 5G playing a key role in new business models. So in the enterprise market, the tariff model where, uh, may evolve from data volume-centric model to a network as a service or a platform as a service model. We're certainly seeing discussion. Ancha Williams at um, Deutsche Telekom, who's the SVP on 5G campus networks, discussed the need for a modular approach to really integrate enterprise services that customers want on top of the network connectivity. And this will be both services offered directly by Deutsche Telekom, partners, or someone else, as big companies often have their own applications they want to use. So it's a very customer-centric approach to how do you think about the enterprise services space. And we also heard from Telefonica that especially for enterprise, 
5G will be a disruption from just connectivity, as I'd mentioned earlier on a slide. And the vision is really to be a B2B2X platform to serve customer use cases with innovative digital services on top of the platform. Now again, in the enterprise space, self-care is certainly of importance here as well. And the CSPs see enterprise digital self-care as a growing need, both before 5G and in 5G, to provide users with more visibility and control for self-monitoring and self-managing services. So we've seen the discussion uh, from a U.S. operator in the IoT space discussing how they're working with their sales team to train and develop and create solution sales and offer more visibility and control to clients with portals. And this will continue in the 5G era. And we're certainly seeing discussion as well here from Deutsche Telekom um, that they'll need more visibility on SLAs, and enterprise customers will be able to self-manage and monitor services through customer dashboards. This is something that's being done today in 4G and will be evolved in 5G. And again here with Orange, we saw the discussion around the ability to show SLAs to business customers is very important uh, to use 5G in their business processes. One of the main things in 5G that we're starting to hear uh, very big in discussion, and this is a change in attitude across the board, it's, it's incorporating back into 4G as well, but this is the idea that partnerships are very essential in getting services out to market, both in the consumer and in the enterprise space. So we asked, how are you approaching new partnership-based business models, and do you have systems in place to support easy partner onboarding, joint service creation and settlement, or do you need new services? Um, and as I mentioned, we certainly saw across the board this idea that partners are a key pillar of 5G rollout, as Orange said. And tomorrow we'll offer new use cases that are unimaginable today, so what is needed is more co-innovation to make it happen. Um, we're seeing in an enterprise space in APAC the discussion around lurking with partners to develop new B2B2X models, focusing on slicing, network automation, and supporting billing and revenue sharing of partners. Uh, Alexis Hostos of Telefonica in B2B had said that they will be aggregator of services with security and low latencies at the edge, with single billing and end-to-end -end management. IT and vertical focused, and they'll have lots of startups and innovative partners in their enterprise services. Anja Williams at Deutsche Telekom mentioned as well that it's extremely important to build and orchestrate an ecosystem to be able to deliver end-to-end -end services and working with different ecosystem players who already know the market space and really want to bring in connectivity with 4G or 5G into their IoT devices. So one thing that we're certainly seeing and, and expect to hear more about, and this is something that's great um, in talking with Matrix as well about, is that the CSPs are preparing to grow value as 5G evolves. Um, 5G will evolve in its real-world capabilities over time, requiring new pricing approaches and increased partnerships, um, which was mentioned by a European telco that they said will start with non-standalone 5G, but they certainly see standalone as a real benefit and will go for it as soon as possible. They also see service-based architecture as a true differentiator of 5G. Um, we also, I don't have it in this presentation, but it's in the report, we also discuss network slicing as a key topic for how do you think about introducing that into your pricing strategies. And we certainly saw that discussion that preparing for slicing and increased partnerships, the need to be flexible, agile, and to scale with demand and with partners is important. Um, being ready to evolve pricing approaches in 5G as market demands require, and having IT solutions that are ready to do that. Uh, when we talked with Rob Visser at WinTray in Italy, he said that from a charging perspective, it doesn't matter so much what G it is, that they have a very flexible charging system that's ready to go. And Telefonica CEO said that they will do 5G deployments on demand to start, but that they are digitizing systems, analytics, blockchain, and fiber ahead of 5G. So there's a lot of understanding from many of the leading telcos that they need to be ready for 5G service and pricing flexibility as the real-world 5G capabilities evolve. So to wrap up some of the conclusions based on both the user experience analysis that we did and the operator interviews to try to drive qualitatively in-depth on some of these key issues, there were three key points of 5G imperatives 
that we found and that we would recommend. One is pricing flexibility, another is customer centricity, and the third is digital engagement. So to prepare for 5G success and think beyond just that initial launch, it's very critical to be customer centric. Uh, customer satisfaction with 4G mobile broadband is good and customers must be convinced of the value of upgrading to 5G. Moving beyond early adopters to the early and late majority with sustainable monetization offerings is very critical to the success of 5G and the ability to recoup the investments being made. So service providers need to position 5G services to solve customer pain points and to wow customers with new experiences and uses to attract them to 5G. On pricing flexibility, early stage 5G services thus far have mainly focused on more data faster, and there has been a relative lack of services and activities that offer new, innovative, immersive experiences specifically enhanced by 5G. We encourage service providers to be more imaginative at launch and to give themselves the flexibility to adapt quickly to rapidly changing market conditions to address a wide range of customers, partners, and competition, and adhere to embrace very much co-innovation and opportunity to use 5G as a platform for new services coming out through partnerships and focused on what the end users need. We've certainly seen a good wave of collaboration in the enterprise space with pulling in different industry verticals to help them say, here are the capabilities. How can you use this to address your pain points and create something that will really deliver to you what you need from this new generation of technology? And digital engagement, as we mentioned, this isn't something that just goes with 5G, but it dovetails very nicely with 5G and is really an imperative as part of what needs to be delivered with 5G. So 5G arrives as demand for real-time interactive engagement on mobile devices is increasing. Service providers see a greater role for real-time self-care apps in the 5G era to address digitally savvy users an enterprise desire for more control and visibility, and to save costs on how they do this while improving customer experience. So service providers need to expand digital engagement to drive additional discovery, needs-based upsells among 5G users. Thank you, Susan. That was really interesting. Um, I think yeah. before we I open the floor to uh, questions, um, it's time for our second poll of the day. So uh, if we could have that on the screen, that would be really good. Um, here we go. The question is, what do you believe is the single most important thing telcos must do to build a sustainable and profitable 5G-based business? And the options are focus more on the enterprise space than the consumer market, maintain a significant price differential over 4G beyond early adopter uptake, deliver all homegrown and partner services and offers via digital self-care app, um, provide rich new content to all segments, including enterprise, consumer, industry, and others. And uh, also, finally, adopt a powered by 5G approach, uh, not led with 5G itself. Um, connectivity alone is a commodity with zero differentiation possibilities. So while everyone's voting, um, there's still time to uh, ask questions of today's panel. We've had a good number of questions in already, and I'll be working those, uh, working through those uh, shortly. Um, it looks like the voting is settling down with almost two-thirds of people um, saying the most important thing is um, having rich new content delivered to all segments that is uniquely enabled by 5G. I think that's a really important point that, um, that 5G isn't more of the same um, unique enablement that, that 5G has is, is the difference and it's probably where the value lies. Um, I also think it's significant that we're not just talking about consumer apps like low latency gaming, but we're, we're talking about probably industrial and, and enterprise applications that will, will, will truly um, drive value. So I think that's, the, that, that's particularly um, interesting. Um, Susan, is, is that what you expected to see? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a very good question because I do think there's not one size fits all in terms of the answer, and we'll see things evolve. But I do think one thing that 5G does enable above and beyond what 4G has done a good start on is that new rich content um, delivered to all segments uh, that can really address some of the pain points as well as introduce new services that really people say, wow, I want to do that, um, or this will make a difference in my business. 
Great. Thank you, Susan. Let's move on to the, um, the Q&A now. Um, the first question I'm going to ask, actually, uh, while well, I have you, Susan, is to, uh, um, is, is to uh, ask you. Um, so the question that has come in is, um, how, um, how, are the, how are the operators going to prove uh, strength of knowledge in the market um, as there are, are more competitors? Yes, I think that's a good question because I think it's, you know, it's not so much proving your knowledge of the market. I think it's just being very good at listening to customer needs and demand and realizing that what you introduce, you will need to evolve over time because you are in a competitive environment and the competitive offerings will shift what you want to be offering. So being able to have a very fast time to market and ability to flexibly shift your service offerings over time, um, but then also to make something that's very rich and focused on being consumer-centric. So I think a lot of times you need to focus more on how you're serving the customer than specifically how am I beating my competitor. Because if you're delighting the customer and you're offering something that is of demand to them and it's certainly fitting into your competitive landscape, but you have to keep that in mind. But if it is something that does resonate well, then it's going to have a better chance for success. Great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Paul, I've um, got a question for you now. Um, the question is, um, as other articles in, in Vanilla Plus have, have raised and pointed out, um, network slicing um, is, 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 is fundamental within, within 5G. Um, do you see um, network slicing as the killer use case for monetizing 5G? Yeah, that's a yeah, it's a really good question, George. I guess I have to be careful how I answer this, given you've said it's uh, it's kind of key to uh, the success of 5G. But you're allowed to disagree yeah, with I me. Do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I think it, it's one of those. Um, it, it's all about the positioning and thinking. Do I think that network slicing is important for the success of 5G? Absolutely, yes, it is. It's one of those key enabling technologies that, in theory, will help you know the segmentation of a you know kind of a singular network into multiple virtual uh, segments or slices that can then be individually treated and individually shaped um, and of course you know kind of configured and delivered for the specific needs of a market segment so from that perspective um, absolutely it has a ton of potential my only note of mild concern is at the end of the day it's an enabling technology that's all that slicing is it's what then is done with it you know, by the operators, how do they package that to an enterprise? You know, how do they sell, position, package something that is a, you know, kind of, again, a classic kind of underlying enabler, almost like a, you know, a carpenter has a set of tools. Those tools are important to shape the end product, but the tools themselves are not what gets sold or positioned to the end customer. It's the end product. It's the chair, the table, whatever it may be. To me, uh, network slicing is a tool, a potentially very impactful and important tool, but it needs to be looked at through that lens. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I don't think anyone's going to actually sell 5G on the basis that network slicing is, 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 a, yeah, it, it is part of it. I don't think that mm. the customers should even sort of get into the discussion mm. of, of network slicing. I think that makes sense. Uh, mm. Perfect sense, and I, you know, I agree with your analogy about uh, you know carpentry. It's it's a chair, not I've got a nice chisel, <laughs> which um, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. think is important. Um, so let, let's move on and take another question, um, uh, Paul. While, while I've got you, I'll, I'll ask you uh, another question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the question is: What prerequisites does a CSP's BSS stack need to fulfil in order to effectively monetize five G? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, what we could spend uh, a lot of time on, George. But as we don't have a ton of time, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I think the key for this, uh, guys, and I think it's been covered, you know, certainly by the uh, the excellent presentation that Susan gave and my kind of uh, little introduction at the start is, you know, 5G has to be looked at as a kind of a progressive, changing development, you know, for the carriers to truly monetize. Um, to do that, you have to look at all of the enabling you know, kind of back office uh, capabilities to, to do that. You know, we've touched on today that the promise of 5G is consumer, it's enterprise, it's industry, it's IoT, it's partnership, it's lots of things that need to come together in one place. The challenge in doing that, of course, with a, dare I say, kind of a legacy 
based approach is you just create more and more silos uh, of you know kind of operational stuff that will just weigh uh, on the carriers you know kind of future uh, profitability just by you know adding massive amounts of cost um, to me everything has to be focused on you know again kind of serving via as much kind of automated digital first means as possible um, we have to take out a whole array of cost from the carrier model um, and you can only do that by automating service delivery there's lots of ways that can be done but by making things lean making them digital first automating a whole bunch of process and being able to handle the massive scale there is going to be a transactional load on the bss stack um, that we have not seen before new you know new business models new devices new ways of monetizing things they're going to put a tremendous strain so the need to scale the need to scale with you know incredibly low latency and to do so from a lean kind of operational model uh, is vitally important kind of just doing a cut and paste the previous approaches um, will weigh heavily uh, on 5g and certainly weigh heavily uh, on the carrier business model so there there is a need for me george to fundamentally rethink and relook at and take a much more progressive approach uh, to bss architecture and design if 5g is going to sustain itself as a profitable investment uh, for the telco Great, Paul. Thanks very much. I think that's a really um, interesting point, and it actually matches a, a question that's just come in, uh, which I'm going to ask Susan uh, initially, um, which makes the point that 5G is actually far more than the kind of traditional um, cellular devices that we've seen in the past. So, Susan, the question is, what 5G device, uh, aside from um, the next generation of mobile phones, uh, gets you the most uh, most excited? I think, to me, actually, it's the range of devices because I think there'll be quite a few um, different industry segments that'll be disrupted by 5G and find opportunities to to use 5G in their devices. So obviously, automotive um, vehicles, getting those connected is going to be a, a big game changer in terms of enabling more moves to autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, whether it be buses and things in city corridors and smart cities, um, or individual vehicles over time as that evolves. So that's certainly one thing that excites me. Um, another device category I think will be interesting to keep an eye on is what will be used for immersive content and interactive content, um, you know, in terms of VR, AR, um, AR out and about where you're doing things that you can really overlay um, in different things. You might do some of that with a smartphone, but you might have a separate device that you use. Um, and then in IoT and in industrial settings, there's certainly the massive scale um, devices, and then there's also ones that will really need ultra-low latency. So, you know, robotics and things that will change and transform the, um, the manufacturing landscape, for example, um, is certainly going to be interesting to watch. That, that can be such a game changer in terms of the cost structure and the flow and ability to deliver on the business objectives. Um, so I think it's, it's a broad range, and I think creating 5G as an open platform, the ability of 5G to have a lot more capacity to manage more devices all at once, and then particularly for some of the um, low-cost type things in IoT, it'll take time to move to that. We'll certainly see some of the narrowband IoT being enfolded in the next release of the, the standards for 5G, but getting the, the battery life there um, much longer. So having that uh, cost-effective ability to drive solutions. So it won't be all overnight. I think early on, certainly both the 5G smartphones as well as hotspots that can deliver across Wi-Fi um, and get that 5G power out in new locations is, are sort of the early stage ones. But there's a lot of categories of devices and a lot of innovation will happen. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, while we're in this, the area of IoT and, and potentially smart cities, obviously we're looking at very different devices and, and very different types of services. So, Paul, for, from uh, Matrix Software's perspective, what is your, your charging concept for um, services in IoT and, and smart cities uh, in particular? Yeah, that's another great question, George. And it's a... Uh, I think it's one of those you have to look to the past to find some of the answers to the future. And uh, I think if you, if you look at uh, you know, where, where the IoT business model is today, um, it is severely challenged. I'm sure those in the audience that work closely in this space in telco will know that this has proven to be a very challenging low margin model, you know, kind of cents per device per year. And that is an incredibly difficult 
uh, you know, market to make money from. You know, the telco's role typically has been positioned as the connectivity management or connectivity provider uh, for IoT, and that is, you know, the, the reason for that then is, you know, it does become a very, very, uh, you know, low cost or low margin, sorry, uh, you know, kind of uh, service to manage. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, they shouldn't do it. I think the challenge again is it's all about how you go at it. I think in many ways, the models that have been brought to the table and implemented so far, to one of the points I made earlier, are carrying still all the costs and operational burden and overhead that a carrier central operation has with it. And that clearly is the reason why the, you know, the margin has come to such a challenging point. What we have to do is to look at this again through a new kind of progressive lens that says, you know, we have to massively automate this. We have to look at IoT through a, again, a digital light out, fully automated or as automated as can be made um, if we're ever going to make money out of that. You know, whether that's 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, LoRaWAN, Sigfox, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's the concept of automation and handling things from a you know, kind of a zero touch lights out, you know, kind of mechanism. And of course, then using the automation of the back office stack uh, and monetization system to capture the activity so that the carrier is not losing money, not you know, missing out on revenue, but their costs of getting to that are massively reduced. So for me, it's a, it's a progressive change that needs to be made, uh, George. And that, you know, certainly from our perspective, we're seeing operators beginning to do that. We have the capabilities to help them achieve that. Um, but it's, again, it's a step that many still have to take if they're ever going to make a sustainable business out of IoT. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, got a question for Susan uh, now, and it kind of follows on from, from what we've been talking about just now with, with both Susan and Paul. Um, it says different services will consume different data volumes, um, but perhaps some services will need low latency uh, instead of high data volume. Um, how will pricing be formed to take that into account with 5G, and what will be the compatibility with um, current the current network and, and tariffs? And I guess perhaps it's not the same thing because the value might be in low latency or the value might be um, in in high data volume. So how will operators manage to calculate the differences between um, value, I guess, or perceived value, uh, Susan? Yes, I think that's a very good question. I think in part you need to look at what end user segment are you serving with those services. So if it's a low latency, for example, for for gaming, for consumers, um, certainly you can create a bundle. It might have some of the content or cloud-based streaming gaming uh, content as part of it as well, but some of the value would be on the low latency. So you could see an, an envision where that could be something that's a even a temporary, you know, for the next hour, put me in a slice that gives me low latency. Of course, you won't say to the customer, or get a slice, but that might be how you deliver it. But make low latency key for me. I need that ping. I need that ability to really compete well, and I'm willing to pay more for a short time. And for an enterprise, it might be something that, you know, the device might need low latency. Um, it may not necessarily have high throughput, as is mentioned. And the value proposition created and how that gets positioned and priced will need to take into consideration that and not necessarily be a volume-centric uh, price, but recognizing that, that extra value that the low latency is delivering. So I, cer I certainly think we need some innovation there and some approaches on how do you think about the pain points being solved and what you're delivering and where that value is recognized recognized by the person who's paying for that service. Great. Thank you, Susan. I think we've got time to take just one more question. Um, so I've got a question for Paul here. It says, um, does 5G from a consumer perspective provide real benefits in the short term? Um, could a, a new pricing strategy highlight the gap um, between uh, 5G and 4G? Yeah, again, it's a, it's a really nice question, George. And I, and I do think, um, you know, yes, there are options and opportunities uh, to do that. I think, again, if you, for those, I would, of course, recommend kind of downloading the report that Susan mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a ton of good insights uh, within that. Um, I think, again, it, it comes back to this, you know, are we positioning this from a network-centric standpoint or from a service-centric standpoint? I think certainly network-centric kind of additions and positioning will have a temporal value and benefit. That will quickly disappear as others, you know, come into the market with similar and that will kind of, uh, you know, drive the race to the bottom uh, that we've mentioned. I think it's now is time. I mean, for me, 5G comes at a massively important time 
for the telco market. It's one of those, you know, a, a progressive approach is absolutely required here um, that doesn't just look at it through that lens of another G that takes a step back and says, we now have an opportunity to, to bring real value to the consumer market, certainly to other markets, enterprise and others. Um, but to me, it's not a case of giving up on the consumer market. I hear people talking about it's a revolution for enterprise and evolution to consumer. I agree with elements of that, but it almost sounds from that kind of statement that people are giving up on the consumer, which I think is a, uh, you know, is a, is a wrong step to look at, a wrong step uh, to take. Um, there is plenty of opportunity to compel and to drive additional upside uh, from the consumer market. But that will only happen, and to the point I think both Susan and I have raised, is if the carriers are addressing real pain points and introducing a real wow. Doing that through a simple connectivity uplift, dare I say, is not going to deliver either. Great. Thank you, Paul. I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank our speakers, Paul Gainham from Matrix Software and Susan uh, Welsh de Grimaldo from Strategy Analytics, um, and also to the audience, of course, for attending. Um, it's been a pleasure to participate in this webinar, and I, I look forward to welcoming you again to the next Vanilla Plus webinar. Thanks again, and goodbye.